Yeah, so um, anonymity in the fourth gospel. Yeah, John is different from the synoptics. John possesses highly theological content, a fact. Uh, three against one, therefore, synoptics win. John can't be historical. That's a positivistic approach, which is uh, also fallacious. Uh, the blood disciple is not named. Every scene in which James and John are mentioned in synoptics is missing from the fourth gospel. That is a real problem. But what's the explanation? Therefore, the non-named beloved disciple, anonymity, proves it was not John the son of Zebedee. And that's what critical scholars will argue. Now, I'd be happy to believe that if it's true. Well, let's look at how anonymity functions in the Gospel of John. And I deal with these in 36 riddles uh, in the riddles of the fourth gospel as an inductive approach to uh, interpreting John. Well, what's the function of eyewitness and authorial anonymity in John? It cultivates curiosity and intrigue. Uh, cultivates identification. Fill in your name here. Uh, how about motivating exemplary imitation? Intimacy with the Lord, yes. Courage at the cross, good role models to follow. It facilitates embrace of familial ecclesiology, welcoming the mother of Jesus into our homes as well. Entrusting the care of mother Judaism to Hellenistic leadership. That's the kind of thing that uh, Rudolf Bultmann argued. Uh, here we have the entrustment of, uh, of, of Judaism to the Hellenistic mission. Um, or some will say it therefore denies the identity of the author. Well, uh, some scholars will assume the early death of John. De Boer wrote an article in uh, 1888 uh, a papius fragment cited by Philip Sidetes, 5th century, George Hamartalos, 9th century, James and John suffered martyrdom. Therefore, oh, if James died in 44, therefore, John must have died at the same time. Um, so, John could therefore not have written books attributed to him, so there must have been a confusion of John's, and that's what real scholars know. Well, as a result of that judgment, which I think is totally fallacious, um, the one assured result of critical scholarship, as I mentioned, is that John the Apostle had nothing to do at all with the gospel bearing his name. Pearson Parker develops other evidence, like 21 reasons why somebody from Galilee could not have written the gospel of John. But what is needed is second criticality, and I think that's what we all do. It's not just second naivete. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, criticism helps us modify our traditional views. Well, scholars disagree with each other, too. <laughs> I mean, on what point do all scholars agree? And so we have to criticize criticism as well as criticizing tradition. In the discussion last night between Simon and Lee, uh, I talked with both of them afterwards to just press on this question. Do we know of any manuscripts at all where kata name is not a part of the gospel text? And uh, in talk of Simon and Lee, um, there aren't any. <laughs> And yet both Lee and I and the rest of us have been taught that, oh, the original Gospels didn't have names attached to them. That was added clearly in the middle second century. Well, I'd be happy to believe that, but there's no evidence of that. Now, probably you have some scribal work there too, but we need to criticize criticism, not just tradition. There's no evidence for names being um, added later. It could be there's just no factual or evidentiary basis for that. Uh, I, as I toyfully put some energy into my question yesterday, um, Deuteroism, has Deuteroism been established? Do you know who an author of the pastorals was, if not Paul? Claim, you know, um, uh, if, if you don't know that, how can you claim Deuteroism? I'm much happier critically with questioned letters or problematic, you know, authorship issues. But likewise, what if Paul is writing to uh, Anatolia? Uh, and, you know, Colossians and Ephesians and Philemon and uses, you know, um, uh, imagery and themes that are part of that syncretistic setting. Um, you know, might that be an alternative explanation for why some of these letters are kind of different? So I want to challenge, in, in my <clears throat> contextual intro to the New Testament, I, um, I refuse to use Deuteroism. I'll call them questioned letters or questioned writings. I think that's more critically accurate. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be traditional. I'm trying to be hard-nosed critical. <laughs> and you have to apply that towards criticism as well. So early death of John, though, is an embarrassment to critical scholarship. 
um, my mistake is that I actually read Philip and George. Um, first of all, they never say that James and John died at the same time. Um, martyrdom, yes, but was it a red martyrdom or a different sort? Um, second, they both follow Eusebius in claiming that John the Apostle died in Ephesus after Domitian. So they never believed that. that they never would have believed De Boer's article. And yet critical scholars did, without having read the original sources. And therefore, they did not believe John died early. Nobody believed that until the 19th century. And, and it, it's an embarrassment to critical scholarship. Now, again, I'd be happy to believe that John was, was, burned, was, was um, boiled in oil in Rome. But that's just a little you know, detail that, you know, that Tertullian puts out there in the second century that, that uh, nobody else does. So, on this flawed assumption, John's difference with the synopsis are explained as John's non-apostolic origin. John is theology, not history. Learn that. You're going to be tested over it. After all, this is, you know, college or seminary. Emphasis of alien sources underlay John's distinctive presentations. But when I examined all of Boltmann's evidence and Fortinus evidence, there's no evidence for underlying alien sources underlying John. No evidence. Uh, I, I did this research at Tübingen with auto bets. Um, on John... Or maybe John expanded theologically on Mark or the synoptics. If John, assuming the early death of John, Streeter says, oh, well, maybe John is a theological expansion of Mark. Well, 85% of John is not in Mark. Where did that stuff come from? And every place where John is similar to Mark, it's different. So literary borrowing just is not plausible from a critical perspective. And yet Barrett follows him. So does the Leuven School. So does Brody. And yet you have huge problems with that view. But it's based on an inference of John having died early. And therefore, we have to find some way to explain how John's content came together. Well, how about other scholars? Lazarus, Mary or Martha? Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Hey, two to one. He must have been a woman. Okay? I like that as an idea. But Lazarus is not mentioned anywhere else with, with John or another tradition or with Peter or Thomas, or Mary Magdalene, or an eyewitness, not one of the twelve, or John the Elder. Now, Hengel and, ba and Bauckham um, make the mistake of assuming the early death of John. And that's why they go with John the Elder, assuming it can't be John the Apostle. And, and I do think John the Elder is the final, the final compiler of the narrative, author of the epistles. Now, Bultmann thought that also, and I think there's good evidence for that. But that's not to say that John the Apostle did or said nothing about Jesus. So anonymity as a literary device, does that prove that the son of Zebedee wasn't the author? Now, yes, exemplary mimesis is invited, but does that prove that he wasn't the author? So if anonymity or non-named appellation disproves the near-unanimous traditional identification of John the son of Zebedee as a traditional source of the fourth gospel, and some scholars will say, yes, that proves it wasn't written by John. Well, what do you do with the non-named mother of Jesus? Does that prove it wasn't Mary? If you believe A, you must believe B. Well, do you really believe B? <laughs> Did anybody ever really believe B or A? Well, let's look at this. How about alternative explanations? Um, the non-named mother of Jesus, maybe it's because of familiarity. We all knew her. Did anyone doubt that, that Mary was the mother of Jesus or that the mother of Jesus was, was Mary? Everybody knows that, of course. B, um, highly respected. Maybe non-named and her relationship with the Lord is the important thing. Maybe that's a veneration kind of you know, elevation of the person, the mother of the Lord. And then C, nominative clarification. There's a bunch of Marys out there in the narrative. You got Mary Magdalene, Mary wife of Clopas, Mary sister of Lazarus, and Mary the mother of Jesus. So you have to qualify it anyway. Who needs the name? <laughs> and so just mother of Jesus is going to be fine, especially because there are other Marys in the narrative. Well, what if we take those three bases and we apply it to the beloved disciple? Familiarity. We all knew he, who he was. He was a patriarchal, apostolic leader of the community, not just in one church, but in the entire region of Asia Minor, according to tradition. How about respect, especially if he's dead? Jesus never said he wouldn't die. Okay, so I think 
the narrative is finalized by somebody else. I'll call him a compiler because I think he's, he's conservative trying to preserve the uh, beloved disciples' testimony. So the dearly departed special disciple, beloved of the Lord, um, he was our person and he was close to Jesus, even closer than Peter, by the way. And so I think you have competing uh, ecclesiologies as well as competing communities. Um, of course, that would never happen today. I mean, religious leaders would never compete against each other. Um, so, and, and back then, the apostles all agreed with everyone, or with each other, on everything. And so Raymond Brown, get this, argues that because we have just vision of Peter and the beloved disciple, therefore, I'm not sure the beloved disciple really was one of the twelve. <laughs> I see the critique of Petrine hierarchy as coming from within the twelve, and worried that apostolic authority has been hijacked by the proto-Ignatian structuralists in the name of more primitive ecclesiology. Think on that, will you? Never mind. I'm sure that would never happen today. Uh, and how about <laughs> uh, nominative clarification? There's a bunch of Johns in the fourth gospel. So you got John the Baptist, became a man from God. His name was John, yeah, the Baptist. Uh, John the Presbyter, uh, John the father of Peter, uh, and John, the son of Zebedee, uh, those of Zebedee are mentioned in 21.2. Therefore, the dearly beloved disciple of the Lord is not named because his name probably was John. That is the, the, the most probable conjecture if you're trying to clarify nominative identity to simply describe the person because there's a bunch of Johns out there. There's no other proper name, male name, that's used more in, in the narrative. So, um, you, then again, you have default guesses. Now, I would be happy to believe the Gospel of John was written by Pluto the dog. Just show me some evidence. <laughs> or, or anybody. I'm, show me you know it's written by Lazarus. Show me you know it's written by Thomas. Although he believes and then later he doesn't believe. So, I like Jim Charlesworth's work, but that's a real problem with that one. Or how about this? Oh, John the Elder. Now, John the Elder may also have been an eyewitness if he's the author of the epistles, what we have seen and heard from the beginning. Okay, so you could have more than one eyewitness in the Johannine situation. But are you really going to say that somebody who is not one of the 12 is leaning against the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper? Somebody who is not one of the 12, an eyewitness, is going to be at the cross with the women to whom Jesus entrusts the beloved disciple or his mother. Are we going to say that not one of the twelve is hanging out with Peter all the time? <laughs> As opposed to the clear synoptic presentation that Peter, James, and John do all kinds of stuff. They're, they're part of the inner ring. Okay? You even got you know, a bit of invidious tussle back and forth between the Zebedee boys and, and, and Peter the employee. <laughs> okay? To me, that's realism. And, and so, yeah, from day one, but also later in terms of uh, gospel traditions. So, you have connections with Peter in the synoptics. Show me that some of the other views fit that. They don't. Uh, unanimously identified in the second century. Uh, look at Lightfoot's work on that. He says that John the Apostle, the theologian, the beloved disciple, is identified in about a dozen different sectors of second century Christianity. Uh, also, you have two Johns at Ephesus. I'm happy to go with John the Elder as the finalizer, who finalized the gospel after the death of the beloved disciple and also, and also having written the epistles. To me, that, that works pretty well. Uh, so it's a, modified, it's a critically modified traditional view that, that, that I think is most compelling critically. Uh, but then the audacity to pose an alternative corrective to Mark and to challenge Petrine hierarchy in the name of a more primitive, egalitarian, familial, spirit-based, women-affirming ecclesiology versus the primacy-loving Diotrephes, and here we need more writing on 3 John, because Diotrephes, who loves primacy, refuses to receive Johannine ministers in his church. He's even going to kick out people in his church who take them in. Well, that could motivate the elder to get out Jesus' real intention for the church, <laughs> which has the Holy Spirit available to all people, not just the hierarchy and how the Holy Spirit also leads us into truth, and how we have a familiar ecclesiology with vine and branches and, and uh, sheep and shepherd, not just um, petrified ecclesiologies, if I can say it that way. I mean, Peter presented as returning the keys back to Jesus in John 6. You have the words of eternal life, not I. 
my goodness, how would that have been understood in the light of Matthew 16, 17 to 19? In the late first century, people would, I think eyebrows would have been raised. Oh my goodness. Peter, in, in, in proto-Ignatian kind of a context, <clears throat> is emphasizing authority of Jesus through the Spirit, not just the authority of, of, of diatrophies. Now again, Harnack argued that diatrophies might not have been the first hierarchical monopiscopal leader in early Christianity. But Harnack would have said, or did say, but he's the first one we know of by name. <laughs> now again, it can also work well. In Matthew 18, forgive seven times 70. And so you have Matthean ecclesiology, which has nuance and graciousness. All it takes is one bad example to either frustrate charisma or to frustrate hierarchy. And so I think that's a part of what's going on in the later first century situation. So how about an overlooked first century clue to Johannine apostolic authorship? And I included this as Appendix 8, the last appendix in Christology of the Fourth Gospel. Here's the third edition of it. Um, so you have a composite statement in Acts 4, 19 and 20, which nobody had written on before that I'm aware of. I, I looked at you know, 20 commentaries. But here's the composite statement to use Sean Adams' language at Glasgow. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. You know, classic platonic rhetoric, you know, God versus, you know, human stuff. Now, Peter says something similar in 529 and 1117. So, did historical Peter say that? Who knows? But it's a Petrine cliche, which Luke furthers. But look at the next statement. It's a Johannine trope. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And the closest parallel is 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen and heard proclaimed from the beginning. So here we have John the Apostle, not John the Elder, presented as speaking with Johannine trope a full century before Irenaeus. It's not my fault. I only read it. But it, it just caused me to think from day one that the certainty of John's non-authorship is not as solid as we have been invited to believe or sometimes forced to accept if we're going to be thoughtful, critical scholars. I'm saying there's an exception and it requires, I think, critical consideration. So an explicit connective of John the Apostle, not the elder with the Johannine trope, full century before Irenaeus approximates a fact. Now throw this in um, with, with the point that, uh, that, that Simon was making um, last night about it is John the Elder whom Papias cites in um, Church History 339. Um, yeah, Mark's pretty good, but it's in the wrong order. Maybe John's different order, early temple incident, connecting that with the prophetic work of John the Baptist, maybe that's rooted in historical opinion. Maybe two, uh, uh, you know, four visits to and from Jerusalem, not just one. Maybe that's rooted in historical opinion. Maybe the Last Supper uh, on Thursday night before Passover uh, is rooted in historical opinion. You know, putting some things straight. I made the crucifixion at noon instead of instead of at nine. Uh, you know, maybe some of these differences are rooted not in the theologizing work of the evangelists. Maybe we have historical opinion here, thank you very much, but <clears throat> Mark got it kind of wrong uh, as a way of pushing back against that, at least in John's first edition. How about not history as such? But, you know, Peter's preaching to the needs of, the you know, of his audiences. So there's critique as license. If he can paraphrase it, so can we. Or how about, now here I do think that John's rendering of Jesus and his language, I think that represents the evangelist's own paraphrasing of Jesus. But each of the nine I am metaphors and themes occurs in the teachings of Jesus in the synoptics. So one cannot say that Jesus never said light of the world. Although in Matthew, it's you're the light of the world. In John, I'm the light of the world. One cannot say Jesus never said shepherd, okay? Well, you, you, you got, you know, shepherd parables in the Q tradition, okay? So I'm happy to see John as paraphrasing and morphing things according to his own teaching but isn't that what we all do <laughs> in terms of making something relevant? So, um, and I think that's what history does. History is, is never simply objective rendering of a chronology. Real history, if you look at Mount St. Helens and earthquakes, real history is not, you know, just flatline, nothing's happening. Real history is, whoa, that's significant. 
<laughs> okay? So identifying significance is a subjective feature of determining what is historic as opposed to what is simply a, a, a bland chronology. And so the inference of significance is always a part as a subjective judgment as to what is to be preserved and then rendered in later uh, uh, situations. So I think we have to rethink von Ranke. And, oh, and von Ranke also didn't always do objectivism. You know, he's thinking about appropriating things for German, you know, identity and nationalism, those kinds of things. So, yeah, uh, so we can paraphrase too, which is just fine, at least in a Johannine opinion. Now, problematic, yes, but that, that might account for some other stuff. And then, and then Mark made no mistakes in the duplications that he, that he made. He was, just, he was just trying to be conservative, leave nothing out. So two feedings, which are very similar, except for some numbers and, and a few things. Uh, sometimes multiple sea crossings and whatever. Yeah, that's fine, but we'd rather not have duplications. Oh, if you have an aversion of duplications, then maybe that's why John doesn't duplicate Mark. <laughs> it's already out there. Or how about the first ending of John? Um, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples not written in this book. I know Mark's out there. Stop bugging me for leaving stuff out, all right? Oh, but these are written you might believe. <laughs> So that might even acknowledge Mark's out there and the non-duplicative interest of the first edition of John. And then the elder in finalizing it is also kind of pushing back in favor of Johannine selectivity. Look, we already added John 6, okay, in the feeding, in the later material, and we, and we already rectified Peter in John 21, you know, and added some other stuff. But, you know, if we would have included everything in the synopsis, you wouldn't have enough libraries, let alone enough books. Okay, so get off our case. Uh, this is selective history, and thank you very much. And, I, I mean, in both endings, you have a defense of Johannine autonomy as an alternative rendering of the ministry of Jesus in Johannine perspective. So, uh, with Culpepper, and here in... Uh, the fourth gospel and the quest for Jesus, I lay out a bioptic hypothesis, uh, John's relation to each of the different traditions. Um, yeah, so I'll, this overall theory is John's dialogical autonomy. And I'll be working with Cascade Books to get out a book on that as well. Uh, my, my, the Anderson overall theory, publishing several essays and laying that out as an overall theory of Johannine composition and uh, history of the Johannine situation and gospel relations. Got it. Um, first edition um, augments Mark. I think John's tradition is a source for Luke. What I received from eyewitnesses and servants of the Logos. Thank you, Johannine tradition. Luke departs from Mark six dozen times in ways coinciding with John. Great catch of fish. Um, the right ear is cut off. On the transfiguration, they beheld his glory, Mary and Martha. I think the Johannine tradition in its unfinalized form is one of Luke's sources, and he says so. Um, the compiler adds later material, harmonizes with the synoptics, and then John's familial ecclesiology provides a corrective to rising institutionalism. So uh, we know his testimony is true, kind of wraps it up. So the non-named appellative of the mother of Jesus affirms her being Mary, I think, and therefore the non-named beloved disciple draws John the apostle back into the Johannine fray. However, um, if we draw in John back into historical memory, what do we do with the fact that the first three quests of Jesus have chromatically excluded John from the quest for historical Jesus? Whoa, that is a headache. That is problematic. But maybe that's why we need a fourth quest for Jesus. Thank you very much. the appearances yeah. and that kind of thing okay. and so but I hadn't put it together in the way that you just did and I, I do appreciate that uh, the anonymity of the Gospel of John isn't uh, related to an appellation that's at the beginning of a manuscript 
so much as the name is not mentioned. I think John, the apostle, wrote it, uh, and it wouldn't have been on an appellation, but uh, it's absent uh, by name in the gospel itself. But I agree with you on uh, where it came from. But thank you so much for that. Thanks, Steve. Um, it also seems like he's not writing about himself. Jesus never said he wouldn't die. Um, he leaned against the president. Jesus. He was present at the cross. It, it's clearly a third person. So it seems to me like somebody is finalizing his work, and I'm happy to go with maybe John the Elder as finalizing his work. Paul, um, you know I agree with, <laughs> we have a very similar composition um, approach. Um, what do we do with uh, the claims of competitive textuality then? I mean, is John as a, as a evolution of Mark um, inherently competitive, or is it a, um, I hesitate to use the word, but it is the right technical word, is a, super, is a superseding of Mark? No, I think it's um, a compliment to Mark. So, yeah. um, I, I, I had gone with Gardner Smith as John the independent of Mark, and I changed my language to autonomous. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I, I, I was an external evaluator of the thesis of Ian McKay, uh, one of Bill Loder's students on John, John 6 and Mark 6 and Mark 8. And he shows ways that John's structure is also kind of similar to Mark's. And in his last two pages, he, he puts forward this guess, which I think is the most plausible, critically, that maybe John the Apostle, or whoever wrote John, here's Mark performed among the churches. And then, and then that would cohere with, even if it's 4th century finalized, uh, the, the uh, 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 canon, um, that uh, people say, hey, you need to write down your own story. <laughs> and so uh, providing his view in the light of Mark. So with Bauckham, uh, John for readers and hearers of Mark. Mm -hmm. I think the first, okay, get this. If John 6, feeding 5,000, sea crossing, Peter's confession, and John 21, great catch of fish, if those are later material, the first edition of John has only five miracles, not eight. Oh, five signs, uh, five books of Moses, five signs of Jesus. He really is a Jewish Messiah. But get this fact. These are the five miracles that are not in Mark. Oh, and number one and number two. This is before Mark 1. This is before John was thrown into prison, contra Mark 1.14, uh, John 3.24. So this is before John is thrown into prison, augmenting Mark. Oh, and miracle number one, miracle number two. It's not a Semaeus source that had numbers to it, Boltmann. It's, here's some early stuff to help out Mark. Oh, and then Jesus didn't just minister in the north, he also ministered in the south. So here's some three signs. Oh, and get this, Matthew 21, 14 says, Jesus in Jerusalem did other <coughs> signs in the, in the temple area healings on the lame folk and the blind folk. So Matthew affirms the content that's in John, whether, whether Matthew knows John or not. So it be, you have a bit of corroborative influence there. Yes, perhaps corroborative to um, yeah. Rally, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the anonymity. My doctoral work was in participant reference, so all of the pragmatics of things, and I use the uh, race to the tomb as an example of where mm -hmm. the avoidance is almost an over-encoding that draws attention. You know, that it, um, so, but I appreciate the, the, I'll have to look more closely at the interaction of the cross, because that, especially with the other mentions of the Marys, I think there's a lot that could be developed just exegetically within the context that would support the work, but um, thank you for that, I appreciate it. So if you have like a to-do list of things, that would be great, because I'm looking for, you know, for data like that to work with. Okay, yeah, yeah thank you. Let's be in touch. Mm -hmm. Paul, thank you for your paper. Bringing it to the pastoral level, yeah. you've laid out some great arguments. How do you see the pastoral implications of this? You know, maybe how would this be taught in the church? How would yeah. this affect the preaching? Yeah. How can we bring it to the people? Um, first of all, what we tell our students. Um, it's in the Bible, doesn't matter who wrote it. <laughs> uh, with Culpepper, we have to interpret the text as it stands, regardless of the theory of, of authorship. And so we have the text as it stands. Um, I, I'm happy to say, um, you know, the fourth gospel, uh, so, I don't know, I might get bolder and say, well, as John says, 
I mean, that's certainly the name of the book. Um, <coughs> you know, if I still want to, you know, be cautious about claiming too much about John the son of Zebedee. Um, but what what I will do though is to say, well, well here, here we have um, memory of Jesus that gets developed and then delivered in in some different ways later, or in some contextually appropriate ways. Um, think about Mary Magdalene. Um, simply in the mention of her name is recognition given. Now, how is recognition, uh, how, how do we hear our name mentioned by Christ in a spiritual way? It might not come through our ears, but, but how do we become open to recognition? And so just, you know, um, uh, picking up on the content and assuming that it has, you know, some kind of memory connection to it, but also delivered in particular situations, you know, works, works pretty well. Um, on, on John and the Synoptics, um, I mean, when I'm preaching, I won't say, well, in bioptic perspective, from a Johannine independent, no. I'll say, um, notice how this scene over here in Mark is presented in a similar but different way here in John. Isn't that interesting? You know, I'm happy to say both are true, but how are they true? And so just, you know, do that kind of comparison contrast. <laughs> or I might say, um, notice how Luke follows John here in this case. And so just, you know, kind of working those ways. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you.